Roz, and good morning, everyone. Um, I hope I can be heard clearly. I would like to welcome you all here this morning uh, to this webinar to launch our uh, the reports from our 2019 research promotion scheme. Uh, and it's only a terrible pity that we can't welcome you to our building on Clyde Road in Balls Bridge, because it would have been lovely to see everybody in person uh, and have a, a nice opportunity to, to network and chat after the presentations. But I think we're all finding we're learning new skills in these days and hope Hopefully you will find this webinar format uh, just as productive. I'd like to thank all the participants coming here this morning. So the research teams and also those who've uh, agreed to act as panelists and particularly Minister Burke, Minister of State with responsibility for local government and planning at the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage for uh, contributing the opening address for our event. The purpose of the research promotion scheme is to encourage and promote quality research in the area of disability and to build capacity in the research system on this topic. The NDA has been very proud to be running a research promotion scheme since 2006. It generally runs every two years, subject to the, the funding we have available, and we put out a call for applications on uh, themes or, or broad study areas. So previous schemes have funded studies on topics such as employment of people with disabilities, or sustaining and supporting families where there is a disability, or the last call just before this one was about fostering uh, independent living within our communities uh, for people with disabilities. And if anyone is particularly interested in the history of the scheme and wants to go through some of our back catalogue, last week we launched a publication on 20 years of disability policy development in Ireland, which sets out the NDA's work over the last two decades since its establishment in 2000. And there's lots more available uh, information in that publication. I'd encourage you all to uh, have a little browse through it. It's available on our website. The theme of the 2019 scheme was people with disability experiencing homelessness. At the NDA, we're always trying to promote research that captures the multiple identities of persons with disabilities and reflects some of the broader societal challenges that are being experienced. And we think this scheme certainly succeeded in doing that. We awarded, awarded two research grants and you're going to hear some more from each of the teams uh, funded uh, through this scheme as we go through this morning. The first study explores the prevalence, experiences and support needs of adults with autism who are homeless. This is a mixed method study led by the School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health, Dublin City University and Simon Community Dublin. The second study is led by the Trinity Centre for Aging with an Intellectual Disability and examines the housing challenges faced by service users with intellectual disability or autism who were using the Daughters of Charity Disability Support Services in Dublin. We'll also take the opportunity today to give a presentation on some current housing and disability st st statistics from an analysis of census data done by David Hallinan, one of the NDA's senior research officers. This information is also presented on our website as a fact sheet and there's a background document to support it on where persons with disabilities live and again if anyone is particularly interested in the detail behind this uh, we'd uh, encourage you to visit our website. So I hope you all enjoy today's presentations on this important topic of disability and homelessness and I would now like to formally introduce Minister Burke who has pre-recorded his opening speech. Uh, Cormac, there seems to be a problem with this. The sound is not coming through. Um, 
the City University. And there, there we go. Many characters focuses on the important issue of autism among the homelessness population and highlights gaps in services for this group of people. I want to compliment the research team for their inclusion of people with lived experience of autism and homelessness. The study from the Trinity Center for Aging with an Intellectual Disability, conducted with the Daughters of Charity Disability Support Services, highlights very starkly some of the challenges faced by families with children with an intellectual disability or autism living in emergency accommodation and private rental accommodation. It also highlights the fact that people with an intellectual disability who are living in private rental accommodation are at risk of homelessness and shows how unsuited homelessness services such as hostels are for this population. I will make sure that officials in my department review these reports and consider their recommendations. One of the most striking features of the profile of homeless people in Ireland is the extent to which they are affected by physical and psychological disabilities. We know from the census data in 2016 that 27% of the homeless population were recorded as having a disability. This is double the rate of disability among the general population, which is 13.5%. The rate of reported psychological and emotional difficulties is 4.6 times higher among the homeless population than among the general population. Mental health difficulties are both a cause of and a consequence of homelessness. The psychological stress and poor living conditions of homelessness will undoubtedly have a negative effect on health, especially in mental health. The role of my department involves the provision of the national framework of policy, legislation, and funding to underpin the role of local authorities in addressing housing at a local level. The housing agency is responsible for driving and overseeing the implementation of the actions in terms of progressing housing provision for people with disabilities. The health service executive is responsible for the provision of health care and social supports for persons with a disability and manages a significant annual budget for such services. The Department of Health also provides funding to facilitate housing and support for persons with disabilities in collaboration with my department. The new Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth is responsible for coordinating disability policy on a wider basis. This in turn informs my department. The National Housing Strategy for People with a Disability 2011 to 2016 was published in October 2011 and included an easy read version. The strategy is extended up to 2020 and includes a national implementation framework. These documents, which are joint publications of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the Department of Health, set out the government's broad framework for the delivery of housing for people with disabilities through mainstream housing options. They are developed as part of a coherent framework in conjunction with the government's time to move on from congregated settings, a strategy for community inclusion. I am pleased to share with you that my department are sharing a consultation process on the new housing strategy for people with disabilities in the new year. We plan to have two consultations during 2021 with a new strategy by the end of the year and I hope many of you will participate in that process. In the Programme for Government, the following important commitments on housing were set out. To increase social housing stock by over 50,000 over the next five years, the majority of which are to be built by local authorities, approved housing bodies and state agencies. Include consideration of disability in all housing policy reviews. Ensure an approximate mix of housing design types is provided, including universally designed units, accommodation for older people and people with disabilities. Maintain support for housing adaptation grant schemes. In addition to the measures on housing set out above, the government will establish a commission on housing to examine issues such as tenure, standards, 
sustainability and quality of life issues in the provision of housing. The mental health transfer with tenancy support project is one of the key deliverables under strategic M5 of the National Housing Strategy for people with a disability. The aims are to give security of tenure to the residents of HSE owned hostels and community residents by transferring the properties to the ownership of approved housing bodies. The residents are supported in this transition by tenancy support officers who are co-funded by my department and the HSE, but employed by approved housing bodies. This project is an example of the type of interagency cooperation that is essential to drive progress using the framework established under the National Housing Strategy for people with a disability. A manual to assist local authority and approved housing body staff to support applicants and tenants that may be experiencing mental health difficulties was devised to address some of the issues that may arise. In 2019, the early intervention process was designed and rolled out as a training program to local authority and approved housing body staff I am also aware that the NDA developed guidance for local authority housing officers, specifically on assisting people with autism. I am aware that the Centre of Excellence for Universal Design is part of the National Disability Authority, and my officials have engaged with them over several years on the issue of universal design. In 2019, we received a policy advice paper from the NDA on universal design of homes as a result, one of the actions of the National Disability Inclusion Strategy. I am committed to working with my officials to see how the recommendations in that report can be progressed. I understand the importance of future-proofing our housing stock using universal design approach, whereby people have access to homes, regardless of their age, ability, or disability. My department has, in partnership with the Department of Health, already committed to housing options for our aging population policy statement to introduce measures to ensure that over a five-year period, delivery is increased to ensure that 30% of all new dwellings are built to incorporate universal design principles to accommodate our aging population. This will also have great relevance to persons with disabilities. It leads me to wish you well with your seminar and to formally launch the Disability and Homelessness Report and congratulate the authors on their important work in both reports. I know that one of my officials, Eamon Waters, who is Principal Officer with Responsibility for Homelessness Policy, Funding and Delivery, is taking part in the panel discussion. And I know you will be able to answer any questions you may have regarding our department. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Aideen and to the Minister. Um, apologies, the sound quality, I think some people were having a problem with that, but I think it improved as it went on, so I hope you were able to see that. What I should have said at the beginning is that this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available afterwards for anyone who wants to, to watch it. Um, the Minister also conveyed his um, apologies that he couldn't, I, I can't say be here in person, but he was more virtual than he would have liked to be, um, but it, it wasn't possible for him to take part uh, in, in, in this session, which is why he pre-recorded. Um, I'd now like to turn to my colleague, David Hallinan, who um, is just going to do a very short presentation on where people with disabilities live um, using an analysis of the census data. David has also pre-recorded his uh, presentation. Cormac, we've an issue with sound there again. There. 
we'll just try and relaunch that. Okay, Cormac, if there's a problem there, maybe we'll just skip that for the moment and come back to it. Would that be okay? That's and absolutely fine if you wish to. Yes, apologies. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. And uh, we'll move to um, the study from Trinity College and Dr. Marianne O'Donovan. Marianne joins us from um, Sydney, Australia, where I believe it's about 9 p.m. in the evening. Um, and where the weather, I'm sure, is a lot warmer than our cool November or our cool December day in Ireland. Um, Marianne recently moved to Australia, but she had been working in, in Trinity prior to that and is the principal investigator on the, the Trinity study. So I'll pass over to you, Marianne, if you turn on your, your video and your microphone, and then you can share your screen, please. Thanks, Rosalind. Uh, great to be here. Um, hello everyone, um, I'm delighted to get the opportunity to present on this project on behalf of the project team, which is a partnership between the Trinity Centre for Ageing and Intellectual Disability and the Dorset of Charity Disability Support Services. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so. Is that okay? Can Bernadette, can you see that there? Yeah. Uh, great. Yes, yeah, that's great. Uh, that's there, Marianne. Great, thanks a million. So I'm going to start by sharing a quote from one of the participants, and I feel like this really encapsulates the importance of home um, and having a home in terms of our own sense of identity, our self-worth, and our sense of belonging and sense of value. So Nadia, mother of a child with disability, says, if you do not have a home, you do not have anything. Any human being who is taken out of their house, it is like you are stripped bare naked. Everything is taken away from you. You feel the value of life is taken away from you. You just become like a nobody. You feel like you don't belong at all. You become another human being, not the same human being. You can take away the money from me, take away all the things that I have, but leave me in the house. And today we're going to hear many testimonies from people about the importance of housing, the importance of home, um, and the difficulties that people with intellectual disability and autism and their families are finding to um, get stable, adequate, um, quality housing. Um, so I would like to thank Nadia and all of the participants, all of the families, the individuals with intellectual disability who gave so generously of their time um, and share their experience and their real life experience and the staff within the Dorset Charity who participated also. To the wonderful project team, Kathy Ann Kelly, Emer Lynch, Linda O'Donnell and Michael Foley, um, who worked tirelessly to really ensure that the voice of people with intellectual disability and autism and their families was truly highlighted in this project. For the steering committee, Professor Mary McCarran, Professor Philip McCallion, Associate Professor Christine Linehan and Ms. Patricia Cleary, for their guidance and advice throughout the process um, and particularly around COVID-19 when we had to revisit our research design and see how we were going to proceed in, in such challenging times and to our funders, the National Disability Authority for um, giving us the opportunity to pursue this project. I'd also like to thank Bernadette and Catherine, the ISL interpreters here today and Michelle who is doing the closed captioning. So what did we set out to do? So we wanted to explore the experiences of homelessness and the risk of homelessness for people with intellectual disability and or autism and their families with a particular interest in the interplay between the socioeconomic factors, cultural and ethnic issues with disability in leading to a risk in homelessness, as well as the challenges people face to having stable housing options um, and factors that lead to this group being placed in inadequate housing as well as a particular issue and risk that people are facing around returning to residential services, which as the minister just said is against national policy um, in terms of decongregating people. But we are finding that 
on the risk of homelessness, people are being moved back to residential. So what did we find? We found there's an over-reliance on the private rental market. There's a lack of suitable affording, affordable social housing, which has been shown to be a primary reason for return to residential services. Substandard and inappropriate accommodation, and some of the stories that you'll hear are quite stark and quite upsetting. Practical difficulties in navigating the housing market. It's a quite complex market, complex forms, not accessible, difficult to understand. And we're talking about people who perhaps have lower levels of literacy. Some maybe don't have English as their first language. Um, so lots of challenges in, in accessing the services and supports that they need. A specific lack of awareness of their needs and a lack of consultation and choice around where to live and what is appropriate. We will also look at the risk of care crisis. So with this aging population of people with intellectual disability and aging carers, there's a subsequent um, link to emergency accommodation for this population. So why did we focus on people with intellectual disability and autism? Well, there is limited research evidence in this area, and yet frontline staff experience in the disability sector and in the homeless sector will attest to the fact that people with intellectual disability and autism are um, experiencing homelessness and are at risk um, of homelessness. There's some acknowledgement in the literature around this invisibility of intellectual disability um, in homeless um, research and homelessness data. Um, and we really wanted to explore this further and to make visible this issue um, in Dublin, in Ireland. The literature will also show that there's a breakdown in social support as a major risk factor um, to unstable housing options for people with intellectual disability. And this falls through in terms of our data as well. In Ireland, and the Minister spoke to this, we do have a national housing policy for people with disabilities. We have our policy for decongregation, which looks at the movement of people with intellectual disability to the community um, and more independent living options. However, this is still to be fully realised. There is a distinct lack of recognition or policy on adults with disability living with family carers. So nowhere in the housing policies or in carer strategy is this acknowledged or planned for. And this population is growing. The UN Convention under Article 19 notes housing as a basic human right for people with disabilities, although the Universal Declaration of 1948 had set out housing as a human right for all humans. Um, in 1948, and housing as a non-medical determinant of health. So stable housing directly impacts on health outcomes. And we will explore some of that and show some of the impact of unstable housing on the health and mental health of people with intellectual disability and their families. And what did we mean by homelessness? For our study, we looked at and were guided by the European typology of homelessness and housing exclusion. So it's a broader definition that, that exists in um, the Irish legislation and much broader than just without a roof. So a lot of times when people think of homelessness, they think of rough sleeping. However, this definition incorporates houselessness. So living in temporary accommodation, insecure housing, whether it's couch surfing or um, staying with friends or being under threat of eviction and inadequate housing. So failing to meet the needs of people or being um, presenting major inconveniences to the people in that house. And we'll see that when it comes to the link with disability services later on. It was a mixed method study based in Dublin in partnership with the Dorset Charity Disability Support Services. And that um, acted as a case study site for our work. We explored the experiences of staff um, working with families and individuals, the families themselves, um, and then specifically contacted individuals with disabilities who are accessing the services there. So we accessed or had some analysis of the Dorset Charity Service Database to provide a profile, a sociodemographic profile of service users in that area. Um, the social work team also did a review of um, their caseload for the last 10 years. Um, and this was really to explore differences between the database and the caseloads and to unpack those differences in, in definition um, that exist um, across both sets of data. We had detailed reflections from six members of um, team 
and the Daughters is a charity and these have um, many years of experience in working with people with disability and supporting them in a range of aspects of their life, but in particular in terms of housing um, and transition to independent living. And then we had interviews with five participants with, who had a family member with intellectual disability and autism and four participants um, with intellectual disability and autism and they all had experience of homelessness at some stage. So just a quick profile of the family members, they were aged between 30 and 70 years, four unemployed, and we find, and the, the, the team would endorse the charity would attest to this, that um, it's very difficult for families to maintain employment and to manage the demands of um, care that they have. So for both parents, it's very unusual to have both parents in employment. And when it's a single parent family, it's now impossible to maintain employment and meet the care demands that they have. Um, the length of time in homelessness ranged from one to four years with a, a range of three to five moves for these groups. So that's, we know that moving is stressful. We know that um, emergency moving, we know inappropriate moving, we know that moving to places that are um, away from family, away from friends and away from services um, are going to just add to that stress and have that negative health impact as well. The types of transitions were from home to acute hospital, to private rented, community residential, couch surfing, hotels, family hub, apartment and um, other houses. Individual participants were slightly older, 40 to 60 years, again unemployed, um, low levels of um, in educational engagement, um, number of housing moves between one and eight moves. So some people had moved eight times and those types of transitions were to relatives, to hostels, to congregated settings, respite, community residential and private rented with a range of one to two years for the length of time in, in homelessness. So I'm just gonna briefly look at the quantitative findings. I, just seen if Catherine's going to break. Yeah, thanks Brenda and Catherine. So this is just to give a profile of the, the service users with the Dorset Charity. So it's just over a thousand service users in this service and um, just over half of those were male. Of those under 18 years of age, three quarters were living with both parents. Um, less so as people progressed to over 18 years and 36% of those were living in a residential service. When we looked at the database, we found only three people had been identified as um, being homeless at that time. Now, this is due to a number of factors. Sometimes all of the um, information around homelessness is not, doesn't travel back up to the database coordinator to record it in the database. And also there's differences in how it is defined. So we have the, the Irish legislation and that definition guiding pieces of work, but also we were guided by the, um, the broader definition. Um, and the Doors of Charity have been very open and responsive to looking at that with us. In terms of the work that the social work team did in looking at 10 years of caseload data, what they did find was there was 145 people who were homeless or at risk of homeless over the last 10 years. 78% of these were non-crisis admissions with just over 20% as crisis admissions. So these are the unplanned emergency admissions either into the Dorset Charity Services, into a nursing home or hospital, but effectively the person is homeless. Very few of these were on a social housing list compared with the non-crisis admissions, where it's just under 40% who are on the social housing list, but some of those people were on the waiting list for eight to 10 years. The profile in terms of disability was majority were moderate to severe profound intellectual disability and all had secondary diagnosis of either autism, a physical disability or a chronic health condition. Most of the crisis admissions were aged over 18, which links back to that point about the aging cohort, aging carers, um, and that uh, link into emergency crisis um, accommodation because of the death of a parent or um, ill health. In terms of respite, of the 145 people who were homeless or at risk of homeless, only 45 have availed of respite from the doors of charity. Um, so in terms of staff reported factors leading to homelessness risk, we can see here that issues with the landlord, 
demands of caring, the house not adapted for disability, and aging parents or carer being the most um, frequently reported responses and factors for homelessness. And for factors leading to crisis admission, there's a variety of factors that impact on crisis admissions, and there is some overlap with the more general um, factors leading to homelessness. You can see here the carer unable to continue with the demands of caring, ill health of a parent or carer, assaults on a carer, debt of a carer. Um, so very much linked with that aging population and the increasing demands that they face and their own deteriorating health. So that's really just a, a very brief insight into the profile of, of people um, presenting to services in the Dorset Charity. And we're going to move on to the qualitative piece. And this provides greater insight into that real um, lived experience from the perspective of staff who support families and individuals, the family members, and also individuals with intellectual disability and or autism. There's four main themes that the findings are um, gathered under. So we have socioeconomic, cultural and ethnic issues, inadequate housing, housing instability and return to residential services. So you may remember these were four of the key questions that we presented at the very beginning that we were interested in exploring. Now the sub themes there presented will be presented at the beginning of each section. So we have the staff findings and the sub themes, the family findings and sub themes, and then the individuals. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on present some quotes and link back to some of the key issues. The report obviously goes into much more detail, um, but hopefully what we present today will give you a flavor of the issues and the challenges that um, this cohort are facing. So in terms of socioeconomic and cultural and ethnic issues, as we said, there's a huge um, economic dependence and poverty highlighted um, in the data with, with many families um, having at least one parent who is, is unemployed and then facing into high rents. So Lisa says, high rents, the inability to afford a mortgage and long waiting lists for social housing leave families vulnerable. For families who have a child with a disability, this is greater because they also have a need to be near services and may have specific housing needs. The cost of disability is well known. In addition to the socioeconomic factor, there are also um, issues around um, discrimination um, and marginalization that some of this population are facing. And here Kevin talks about the neighbors complain, the family do not speak English as their first language. On occasion, this anger can become racist in nature. They were harassed based on nationality, but the anger may have originated from their boy being seen as noisy and different. Describing a family bedsit in Dublin where a mother and her child with um, autism shared a bed. Laura says, in addition to being extremely cramped, the bedsit is also damp. Black mold has been growing on the wall. Mom has had to stop the child attempting to eat fungus. And for people who are in housing, there's a real sense of insecurity and a real power differential between landlords and a fear of the landlord looms large over these families. Routine landlord visits can be dreaded as they may expose damage or the house may have unusual features such as no unnecessary furnishings, that's to create space. Minor modifications may not be allowed. Consequently, relations with landlords can be fraught and there is obviously a huge power differential which can magnify the threat experienced. And looking at that issue of the house and the service is really important for people with disabilities. So it's not just the home, but it's the connections and access to support services and future life opportunities for um, the individual with disability. As Wendy says, services are patchy in their provision and oversubscribed. So moving area is a big risk. Waiting lists can be very long, so people opt to stay in a service if they have one. Laura also talks about um, this aging cohort. So we saw this earlier in the graphs, um, crisis admissions linked to reduced capacity to provide care because of ill health um, of a carer. And it says, Laura says, older aging parents who are exhausted and unable to deliver the physical and emotional care required are just unable to cope due to ongoing assaults. Many parents and carers reach a stage of being unable to continue caring 
and some service users become ill or have care needs that aging parents cannot manage. Again, I'm going to move on to the family findings now. We'll again look at these socioeconomic issues, inadequate housing, housing stability, and that issue of what is a home, because this is what came up from the families is what is a home, what does it mean? So we saw earlier on in the data that in terms of the profile and this issue of unemployment and the huge demand. So how much time a carer may need to give to support um, their adult child. So Maria speaks about her daughter who's in her mid forties. She needs 24 seven care. From the time she wakes up, she needs someone to wash, dress her. She doesn't do any of those things herself. She doesn't have any speech. Her mobility got worse as she got older. She uses a wheelchair. I have no downstairs toilet. Her eyesight isn't great. So there's no um, downstairs toilet and her daughter has mobility issues. Then we move on to this issue of rent and this over-reliance on the rental market and how that can result in very um, difficult circumstances for families and coupled with family size can be quite challenging. So this father, Aliki, um, who's married with two children, described spending six months trying to find a new home to rent for himself, his wife and two daughters. And he says, even if you work, you can't afford to pay the rent because it was a lot of money to pay the rent. In another two instances, the rented home that the family were living in was already too small to accommodate the growing family needs. There was difficulty finding an alternative and they were served notice to quit. This mother, um, Abiki, talks about um, the difficulty she had with an appropriate space. So she had three children, two of whom had special needs. And she speaks to the point that my husband, he was staying in a studio apartment. When I joined him with my son and when I had my second son when I was pregnant and we were trying to look for a bigger place to stay. So a husband and wife with three children, two with special needs, living in a studio apartment. There's also a link with regressive behaviour and um, overall behavioural issues. So temporary solutions to housing have led to a change in family routine, a lack of space, which can then impact on um, a child's behaviour and progression. So Nadia talks about, I was staying out the whole day because he is crying to go home. So we are running to the home where we have lived to show him that we can't, that it is closed. That is something we were doing every day. And this is describing how she was trying to manage the distress that her son was going through after they had been evicted and were currently couch surfing. All five of the family service users in the emergency accommodation experienced depression and anxiety, and two expressed suicidal ideation. Nadia says, I lost self-esteem. I was always anxious. There was lack of sleep. I did not know how to protect my children. I was just losing it. You start to realize that being suicidal is very easy because you think that's the best thing to do is just to end it. Families also spoke of the lack of control and choice that they had, the lack of um, options, and a feeling of coercion being put under pressure by agencies to take accommodation that wasn't suitable. So Helen talks about um, trying to access residential care for her sister when her father of 81 years old was unable to care for her anymore and support her at home. So they went through a number of offers um, one was a nursing home, which was inappropriate for someone um, in their 40s, and they were offered and accepted a residential place. However, there's two issues with this. The residential place was outside of the catchment where her father lived, and he would no longer be able to visit his daughter independently, only with um, support from family members to travel there. And they were offered and told they had to accept on the same day. So there was little time to process that decision-making and to weigh up. Um, other options. We already heard from Nadia and her powerful testimony around the importance of home. And this is supported throughout the interviews from the family members. And Aliki says here, if you have a home, it means everything. For the kids, they have big space. They play like, you know, it's so good. Or sometimes they're in one room. Sometimes they're in the sitting room, also in the kitchen. So this issue of space, of it being a safe space 
and to have family, normal family routines and giving the family independence and the children independence is a really important part of home life. And this is not possible in um, if accommodation changes frequently or if it's inadequate accommodation. So moving on to the individual participants. So these are the four people with intellectual disability and autism who have experienced um, homelessness. We know that people with intellectual disability are more likely to live in poverty, are more at risk of poverty. And this population, um, three unemployed and one was in supported employment, um, limited access to education. Um, and all of these really restrict the building of any kind of economic capital, um, which would enable and facilitate um, a move into an appropriate housing situation. All of the participants spoke about the impact on their mental health, the anxiety and stress, as well as depression. And Graham talks about feeling depressed here and the difficulty of sharing a bedroom with another man. Just sometimes I get a bit depressed and sometimes I get a bit moody with it, you know? Some days it's unbearable. I get this tiredness and not wanting to do anything. So Graham, a man in his 40s, sharing a, a bedroom with another adult male. In terms of choice, in, individuals talked about that lack of choice and the lack of support to access the preferred choice of accommodation um, and presenting to local authorities and declaring themselves homeless, they found to be the situation was really unhelpful. Um, and again, inappropriate options being presented. So Julie talks about her experience. They told me I could go back to my aunties or go to a homeless hostel. I didn't want either of them, you see. They said I wouldn't be safe in the hostel, that they wouldn't recommend it. And back to the congregated setting, yeah, I wasn't happy with that either. When asked about the meaning of home, three of the four participants talked about being close to family and friends, and everyone spoke about the importance of independence. Julie says, I like it because like at night, I can put my telly on and play my music when I like. When I was in the houses, I couldn't do that. But when I'm on my own, I can. And I like having the freedom to go in and out. So I'm just going to sum up. I'm probably due to finish and um, I'll just sum summarize some of the key learning we had from this. So the, we did find an over-reliance on the private rental market a lack of security of tenure, which led to housing instability, a lack of services as well to support people in their housing, which leads to recurring homelessness, a lack of suitable affordable social housing, and that was the primary reason leading to return to residential services. Substandard accommodation. So people living in crowded accommodation, limited space, no wheelchair access, damp, mold, completely inadequate and unacceptable. And then the difficulties in navigating the housing market were raised across the board. Lack of awareness of the specific needs of people with intellectual disability and autism with attendant physical disability. A lack of support from statutory agencies tasked with provision of disability services and a lack of consultation and choice. So people were being pressured to take on options that were not suitable or appropriate for their or their family's needs. We saw the ongoing care crisis, increase in demand of caring, decreasing health of family carers, which was leading to emergency um, admissions, as well as social factors. So experience of stigma, loneliness, social exclusion, being away from family, being away from friends, a sense of marginalization, and an overall lack of individualized supports for these people. So what is home? The right to housing as a core human rights concept absent from Irish housing and health policy. And that continues to be the case. Home for these people is part of a social network, home as a place of independence, home as a safe space. Our recommendations are to have specific focus on people and families with intellectual disability and or autism framed by a life course and human rights perspective in all housing policies and that policy should acknowledge that adults with intellectual disability but not wishing to live um, 
at home any longer need to be facilitated and needs to be resourced. A review of the housing market and the processes, the bureaucracy, streamlining the process, accessible information, easy to read forms. There's a real need for education and training and cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, and the minister did speak to this earlier on, so it would be great to see that happening. Um, and with the UDL for new housing being implemented across the board. The study shows that emergency accommodation is never desirable, and it's definitely not desirable for um, people with intellectual disability and autism. There's a need to revise the eligibility criteria for social housing and to provide greater protection from eviction. And this starts by acknowledging that people with intellectual disability and autism are homeless and at risk of homelessness. It's making this visible, making this issue visible and putting in place the policies and practices to prevent this population from being evicted. Future research should include the voice of those with more profound levels of disability, which unfortunately was not possible um, due to the change in research design um, upon COVID-19. We really need a national picture of prevalence and of the factors. This is a really important um, snapshot within one part of Dublin. Um, and I, I can only imagine that services and um, people around the country are in, involved in similar challenges. And I think it's very important in terms of informing policy that we get that national picture. We also need further information and evidence based on new and innovative models of housing for people with intellectual disability and, and autism, which prioritize independent living options um, and individual choice. And much of that will be linked with um, individualized budgets as well. So I will thank you for your attention. Um, and again, thanks to all the participants and to the research project team. Great. Thank you very much, Marianne, for that really clear presentation. And I think um, you really got across the lived experience of, of people with disabilities and their families, some very stark examples there. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And, and I can reiterate to everybody that uh, the Trinity team did try and facilitate having somebody with that lived experience to share with us today, but just with COVID-19, it just wasn't possible. So I'm going to move on now. Um, we'll go straight to the, the DCU presentation. Um, and they it's pre-recorded and it's split between uh, four presenters. So it starts with Dr. Mary Rose Sweeney, who's one of the co-primary investigators, and she's going to join us for the panel afterwards. She's followed by Dr. Breach Casey, who present the findings. Then Michelle Connolly, who's the research and advocacy officer for Dublin Simon Community, then presents, and she's going to join us on the panel also. And then uh, Mr. Desmond Murphy, who's part of DCU's public patient um, involvement project. Um, he shares his lived experiences with us. Um, so we'll, we'll move to that video now, please, Cormac. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am delighted to be joining you at your um, webinar this afternoon to bring you through the research we did at Dublin City University, uh, which was funded by the uh, National Disability Authority. So my name is Mary Rosemary, and I did this research with my colleague, Dr. Bridget Casey at DCU, um, and also with um, Dr. Andrew Boylson, who's also from the School of Nursing at DCU, and Alistair Churchard from the University of London in the UK. So the study was looking at the whole um, idea of um, autism in homelessness um, and we had some really good partners in this research so we partnered with um, Michelle Connolly and um, Magella Darcy from the Dublin Simon community with Sarah O'Gorman from the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive with Gavin McGrinahan from As I Am and Dara Byrne from Gail Services. Uh, Lucy Whiston and Sophia Kilcullen were our partners from the PPI Ignite Project at DCU and um, Desmond Murphy and one other PPI contributor who wishes to remain anonymous um, were also partnered with us on the research. So we had a great, a great team starting out. Um, so most people on this call will probably know that autism is a developmental disability that affects how one relates to and communicates with other people. And sensory overload is a very significant issue for this population as well. 
So the most recent um, prevalence estimates for Ireland and internationally are sought to be in the region of uh, 1 to 50 to 1 in 100 people. Um, that was a, a DCU study we conducted a number of years ago, uh, that prevalence estimate, which agrees with international estimates. Um, and so adults with autism are at um, considerably higher risk of poorer outcomes, including, you know, there's, there's more um, likelihood they will um, suffer social isolation, uh, discrimination, uh, victimisation, and difficulties even in attaining and maintaining employment. Often they are underemployed and also they experience issues with, um, you know, seeking and securing housing and um, obtaining um, and securing independent living. So just to mention then, uh, the other area we were looking at, sorry, I have to keep moving this around because it's getting in the way of my slides. Uh, so, so homelessness is a, um, a global challenge and it can result from a range of socioeconomic factors such as poverty, again, those issues around employment, uh, discrimination and stigma, and, and also often personal issues such as uh, physical or mental disabilities, um, addiction or relationship breakdown can all contribute to uh, a situation of homelessness. Um, the recent government figures we, we have in Ireland estimate um, the number of homeless adults to be around uh, 6,000. But um, of course, we know that's a minimum estimate as there are many people living in situations of, of hidden homelessness as well. So the relationship between homelessness and autism is, is fairly um, underexplored in, in research terms. But there is emerging evidence that people with autism are overrepresented in homelessness. And this research um, evidence mainly comes from a recent um, and very robust study from the UK um, led by Channeran, sorry, by, Church, by, our, by our co investigator Churchard et al., um, which was published in 2019. And that group estimated that the prevalence um, of autism among a cohort of long term homeless people in the UK was in the region of 12%. So you can see straight away, that's a lot higher than the estimate we have for, for autism in the general or the, the housed population. Um, but we have no previous study or no evidence emerging from Ireland, which has explored this um, in this context. And um, it's probably worth mentioning as well that autism prevalence estimation is notoriously difficult. Um, even in a in a you know a stable or, or a housed population, so you can imagine the challenges in trying to get a prevalence estimate in in a homeless uh, population. So we set out then with three broad aims at the outset of the project. We wanted to estimate the number of people who have autistic traits um, in in a re in a representative sample of homeless people based in Dublin. And that was how we were going to capture a measure of autism prevalence, um, because obviously, you know, we weren't going to get um, these individuals into any kind of, a, a, you know, a clinical multidisciplinary assessment setting. So this was um, how we were going to approach this study. Uh, we wanted to explore the lived experiences and perceptions of homeless service provision in a small group of adults with autism who have or are experiencing homelessness. And we also wanted to look at the people who, the key workers and the service providers who, who provide services in a homeless context to see what they knew about um, the needs of people with autism and also to explore their own needs in relation to training and knowledge acquisition to help them to optimally um, provide services for clients with autism. So I suppose there were a number of methodological considerations at the outset. One uh, was that we were, of course, concerned about, you know, potentially doing um, some harm while doing this research. Um, so we were worried about in involving individuals directly in the research if they had never previously thought about the fact that they might have autism um, and we didn't want them to be worried about it. So that raised some ethical issues for us. So that's really the main reason why we decided to go with uh, that coupled with the fact that they are a hard to reach population, we decided to adopt the approach used by Churchyard et al. In, in the UK. And that was a proxy informed approach where key workers completed screening instruments on behalf of all clients in their caseload. So they were completing the information by proxy. So the first study then was the prevalence estimate. Um, so Dublin Simon key workers completed 
a researcher administered screening tool on behalf of all clients in their caseload. And this screening tool was, um, the abbreviation there is the, the DAHI survey. And this was developed by the UK team that I mentioned. And it really explored the absence or presence of certain autistic traits. And they are listed below there, but in summary, you know, exploring deficits in sort of communication, in socialization, in um, developing understanding and maintaining relationships, uh, whether there was the presence of stereotypical and repetitive um, behaviors, whether there was an insistence on, you know, very strict adherence to routines and, um, you know, very fixed interests and whether there was, you know, a sensory overload issue present. So key workers were based in settings which were representative of a range of services provided by, of the full range of services, I should say, provided by Dublin Simon um, Services. And they included um, emergency accommodation, supported housing and treatment and recovery. And we invited all 14 key workers who worked in one designated area of, of Dublin City Centre to take part. And that was in an effort to be as representative of a, a, a given population as possible. So the second study then we were looking at the lived experiences of individuals who were um, experiencing homelessness and also who self-identified as having autism and they were recruited via their key workers. So we used a narrative interviewing method uh, to um, get the uh, participants to share stories with us about their perspectives um, of, of you know, autism and homelessness. And the data was analysed then using the Reisman's narrative analysis um, to construct an overall, um, you know, to capture the overall trajectory of their life. And then this was further analysed to result in the generation of common themes. And the third study then was a practitioner knowledge and skills. Um, so it was an online uh, anonymous survey which was circulated via, via Qualtrics, which is um, an online platform we use at DCU. Uh, and it was disseminated to uh, key workers working in um, Irish homeless services. Um, and it was sent to about a thousand individuals to explore um, key workers' self-perceived knowledge of autism and um, their, uh, their own training needs, to look at their perceptions of the strengths and needs of people they, they provide services for who um, have autism um, or are autistic, and um, to look at their experiences and opinions regarding the level of quality of service provision for autistic adults provided in Irish homeless um, services, and also to explore their recommendations. So, of course, um, prior to all of this, we obtained um, research uh, ethics approval from the committee at DCU. And um, of course, uh, the pandemic struck in March, um, right in the middle of data collection, uh, so we had to uh, submit an amendment um, to um, approve the online collection of um, our data through Zoom. Uh, and so that was both for the prevalence study, which around 40% of the data was collected by Zoom, and also um, for the, um, the narrative interviews. Thanks, Mary Rose. My name is Bridge Casey, and I'm going to talk you through the results of the study um, and the conclusions that we came to, and then the recommendations as a result of the findings. So I'm going to start off with the results, first of all. So study one, uh, which was a prevalence study, and this was uh, the key workers from a Dublin Simon Service uh, completed screening questionnaire questionnaires on behalf of 106 clients across the services. Um, and that included emergency services, supported housing and treatment and recovery services. And from that, a prevalence estimate was achieved. Uh, so out of the um, 106 uh, clients included in the screening, three people uh, screened present for autistic traits, which gave a, a prevalence estimate of 2.8%. A further seven clients screened as possibly present for autistic traits, and that gave a total prevalence estimate of 9.4. In relation to the second sub-study then, uh, which was the lived experiences of people who had autism, uh, who were experiencing homelessness, uh, there were some very interesting findings uh, in that study. Uh, and 
people experienced autism in the context of other complexities, for example, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, bullying, family issues, uh, ignorance, neglect, stigma and shame. And these psychosocial impacts of autism as well were profoundly traumatic uh, on, on people in the study. They felt different, they felt not understood, and these feelings contributed to lifelong dis disruptions to their sense of identity, belonging, and a sense of inner home which is a place of comfort within themselves and they find that very difficult to achieve. Uh, they experienced distress at not being diagnosed or supported to understand their autism when they were younger and they believed that this actually compromised their mental health in later years and in the case of these three uh, people uh, led to addiction issues which preceded their homelessness. Um, also then they experienced challenges in accessing appropriate homeless services for their housing addiction and their uh, autism related needs. Um, the participants saw some of the house, homeless services as being crowded, threatening um, and chaotic and they identified the lack of autism friendly facilities. They also found uh, communication difficulties and a perceived lack of autism sensitivity or awareness among staff. Um, in relation to addiction services, uh, the participants found it difficult to engage with these because they were based on group participation, uh, which the participants perceived as distressing and potentially threatening, um, given their challenges with uh, these kind of group contexts, as is uh, common to a lot of people with autism being expected to talk about their feelings and navigate groups, um, and particularly when there's past experiences of bullying. So in relation to the third study then, uh, which was about the pr practitioner experiences, uh, knowledge and skills, we had 206 responses there. Um, and once again, the, the actual practitioners have highlighted challenges in accessing screening and diagnosis uh, for adults um, with, with autism uh, disorders. Um, and 92%, which is a very high figure, uh, reported that there were no specific interventions or arrangements for people with autism within their homeless services. Um, in relation to the practitioner's uh, own knowledge, which we tested as part of the survey, uh, they showed a good level of knowledge regarding common autistic traits. However, there's less knowledge was evident regarding sp specific challenges and comorbidities amongst homeless people, for example, mental health issues, trauma, vulnerability and addiction. Um, interestingly, the practitioners themselves identified gaps in their knowledge and, and uh, skills. For example, 85% had had no formal autism training and 65% uh, identified as having lay persons level of knowledge in autism. Um, nearly three quarters of the respondents identified themselves as either underconfident or lacking in competence concerning assessment, communication and understanding of the needs of people with autism. Um, and I suppose not surprisingly then, 80% uh, of the respondents called for autism specific training. So when we pull these all together, we, we arrive at our conclusions and obviously the prevalence estimate of 9.4 is lower than that uh, reported by the Churchyard study in the UK, which was 12%. Um, however, that UK sample was comprised mainly of uh, people who had long histories of homelessness. Uh, and most of them were rough sleeping, whereas the Irish sample had a shorter homeless duration. They tended to be in more stable accommodation and they were engaging with services to a greater extent. Um, that estimated prevalence of uh, 9.4 is worthwhile uh, noting it's considerably higher than the prevalence estimates in the house population uh, in studies by um, Sweeney and Boylson uh, who were also on this study um, the indication was that people with uh, autism um, in the house population was 1 to 1.5 percent which shows that uh, people with autism are overrepresented represented in the homeless population. Um, and autism is a risk factor then for entry into homelessness and an added challenge to exiting from homelessness. 
homeless uh, adults also experience comorbidities um, and challenges. Um, and as we mentioned this already, it, a whole range of trauma, health issues, addiction and, and health and social marginalisation. Um, and the unique characteristics, support needs and their strengths as well of homeless clients with autism are not sufficiently recognised or addressed in housing uh, policy strategy or in housing support provision. Um, early diagnosis of autism remains inadequate uh, and screening, support and homeless prevention and intervention among adults with autism is poor. Um, practitioners in homeless services feel challenged in addressing the autism specific needs of this population and have called for training in this area. Um, in terms of the recommendations then that, that we'd like to make in relation to the study, uh, the first few are in relation to screening and diagnosis, where we see that there's quite a lot of need for research and development in this area. For example, uh, increasing investment in diagnostic training services and supports for autism in childhood and adolescence. And we would see this as a form of primary prevention, uh, because obviously if people are well looked after and it's been diagnosed and supported properly, there's less risk of them becoming marginalised and homeless and suffering a whole range of mental health issues as well. Um, we recommend that uh, there's further validation studies are undertaken regarding screening and, and diagno diagnostic tools uh, for, for adults to ensure that these are fit for purpose. Um, and in addition to um, uh, developing diagnostic tools to suit uh, varying autism populations and those with comorbidities, because one size doesn't fit all um, and these tools need to be very very sensitive to, to uh, be able to detect autism whenever there are, are other sort of coexisting or confounding um, comorbidities there. Um, we're also uh, recommending that uh, basic autism screening tools are developed that can be used by a whole range of practitioners. Um, we're not suggesting that these are sophisticated screening tools, but certainly that, uh, that they're a first step. Um, and we're not aiming to achieve diagnosis at this stage, but just that if autism fe features were able to be um, detected uh, at an early stage within services, it would certainly pave the way to more uh, sophisticated uh, diagnosis. Um, and this, um, these kind of uh, basic tools have been proven to be very useful in terms of um, conditions like depression and anxiety and have been widely used by a range of practitioners. Um, so that would be a really useful uh, intervention. Um, and from that, then ensuring that there's clear pathways to proper psychological diagnosis and service provision for adults with autism through appropriate uh, referral pathways. Um, it's also really essential to develop evidence informed through research um, and practice, uh, practice based research and research based practice informed uh, primary, secondary and tertiary prevention of homelessness amongst uh, autistic populations um, and identifying and addressing barriers to accessing support services uh, for people uh, with autism who have addiction, comorbidities and homelessness. Um, Cross-disciplinary models of support for, for adults with ASD is also essential, so that it's a complete wraparound service. Um, and where people need actually specialised services for maybe very specific mental health issues or addiction issues, that that um, service is, is specially tailored to meet the needs of people with autism. So in relation to policies, infrastructure and training, uh, we're recommending that there is a, a you know, a whole scale review and development of autism policy, particularly in relation to homeless prevention and intervention uh, in collaboration with relevant services and stakeholders. Um, increased investment in autism friendly environments um, in homeless services is really, really important. Um, and we have seen some very good examples of this in terms of autism support uh, with various um, services developing autism toolkits um, and the NDA have actually put out some very useful guidelines uh, for uh, various service providers 
uh, working with people in, in homeless services. Uh, and from DCU perspective, um, Mary Rose Sweeney and Andrew Boyson uh, from this study also de developed uh, very good guidelines in relation to um, autism-friendly spaces, in our cases, autism-friendly university. So there would be lots of guidelines that could be of use there. Um, we're recommending a uh, supporting uh, development of relevant practitioner skills and evidence-based uh, approaches and interventions, for example, psychologically informed environment and trauma-informed care. Um, we run a certificate in homeless prevention and intervention in DCU, which is very successful and covers a whole range of issues uh, that pertain to people who are in, in homelessness situations. Um, we do do some work around disability and homelessness, uh, particularly intellectual disability, uh, but obviously, you know, be, um, being informed by the findings of this study, we need to do a lot more in relation to autism. And we would recommend that that is spread out uh, and offered to uh, a whole range of practitioners across the uh, healthcare and social care sectors, even people working in, in housing agencies that may have responsibility for placing uh, clients uh, in, in homeless um, services, uh, that would be very useful and would improve interdisciplinary uh, working as well. So now I'd like to hand you over to Michelle Connolly. Um, Michelle is a research and advocacy officer in Dublin Simon. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the research and advocacy officer with Dublin Simon Community. And um, for my presentation, I'm just going to take you through what I feel are the most important points for the homeless sector to take on board. Um, I think one of the really positive aspects of this study is that a lot of the recommendations are very feasible and very practical and will go a long way to making our autistic clients feel a lot more comfortable and supported in services. Um, as a whole, it was an absolute privilege to be a part of this project. Um, it was as rewarding as it was challenging to get it over the line given the year that we all just had. Um, but I'm really delighted to be an early contributor to research in this area and I'm really looking forward to seeing the work and the conversations that develop as a result of this being published today. Um, I think the study is really important in that it highlights the high presence of neurodiversity in the clients that come through our doors every day. Um, it really emphasises the importance of listening to and learning from the experiences of autistic people in our services, but it also gives great insight to the staff who care for them and how well equipped they feel they are to do so. Um, so on, just on the back of the recommendations that my colleague Breed has already highlighted, I'm just going to talk through kind of three or four points that I feel are very practical and very feasible, but also just very important for the homeless sector to continuously bear in mind and to continuously implement in our services. Um, first off, I suppose the most striking thing for me was the overlap of experiences of people who are autistic and people who are experiencing homelessness. And then when you are someone who is autistic and experiencing homelessness, there's just a massive level of challenges and barriers that you have to overcome just on a daily basis. Um, I suppose separately, autism and homelessness can have a massive impact on the way you interact with the world and the way the world interacts with you. So in the homeless sector, we're constantly talking about um, addiction, mental health issues, experiences of childhood trauma, stigma, discrimination, barriers to work, barriers to education. And a lot of those things, if not all of those things, are very common to autistic people as well. So when you are both autistic and experiencing homelessness, the importance of the service that you're in, being able to cater for your complex needs or whatever comorbidities might arise, um, can't be understated. And again, it, it just, it comes up again and again and again, the importance of trauma-informed care for homeless services. Um, and again, this research is no different in that respect. Um, the second point that I'd like to highlight is something that we're all very conscious of, but again, I just don't think it can be emphasised enough, the impact of homelessness in itself and the homeless system on an individual. Homelessness in itself is a massive trauma. The homeless system can sometimes be difficult to navigate and the whole thing can just seem really, really overwhelming. Services can be very busy and I'm thinking like if you can imagine 
being in a shared room with three or four other people in some instances. There's just a massive amount of stimulus and you've no privacy, you've no control over your environment. And that's just a really overwhelming and difficult environment for an autistic person to operate in. So again, we really see the need for single unit emergency accommodation and a move away from that shared dormitory style accommodation. Um, the third point that I'd like to highlight is the need for targeted prevention services for autistic people. They've been highlighted as an at-risk group um, for experiencing homelessness and having targeted prevention services that can intervene before they have to enter the system at all is probably one of the best methods we have of safeguarding the group. Um, and then the final point that I'd like to emphasise is the point that Breed raised around awareness and training for staff, just so that they feel prepared and equipped and supported to support any client that comes through the doors, no matter what their support needs are, whether it's mental health, addiction, whether they're autistic or whether it's any combination of all of them and any other support need that might arise for them. Um, having well-prepared, sensitive and accessible staff is probably one of the best supports that we can offer for someone who comes into homeless services. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and I'm going to just hand you over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle, for your interesting contribution. And now I'd like to introduce our final speaker for this session, and that is Desmond Murphy. Uh, Desmond was a peer researcher on the project and is someone who has autism and has an experience of homelessness. Uh, Desmond provided really useful insights and contributed, contributed to our study to a huge extent. So we're delighted that he's able to speak a few words today. So it's over to you, Desmond. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'll just read it. Uh, I have enjoyed myself taking part in the research, which will hopefully be useful for all those who have autism and who are homeless. As someone who has an autism and has had a lot of experience as a homeless person, I have provided some of my thoughts and opinions on this topic below. In relation to autism diagnosis, this report is based on autism and homelessness. It is in my view and experience that many on the spectrum who are homeless have learned how to survive from going through life's hardships and can function well. Therefore, there's a high rate of autism which is under recognized, which is in my view of my own discernment. There are high amounts of autistic people who are rough sleepers in hostels or sofa surfers. What's important is that to me, which is important in my own experience this is that hostel managers grant permission to key workers to discern that they may have an undiagnosed client with autism. With this in mind, there should be a funding or bear with me now, <laughs> whatever the HSE could provide to get the client to test for asparagus. In that event, it could serve or save the client years of homelessness. To live as an autistic child, adult, in a non-autistic non world, and to survive is a great achievement in itself. Not just for me, but all those who survived. You know, in, from an autistic background. Autism and homelessness. I sense many became homeless as their parents could not cope with their extreme behavior. And as a result, an autistic person has to survive on the streets. In many ways, they cut themselves off from society. 
So many young people with a spiritual would be fearful in entering a hustle for the first time. And more than likely thereafter, it would be a personal out of bounds to many on the spectrum. Therefore, I would say it's possible to assume that fear of one's safety could be the main contributor as to why so many Aspies are rough sleepers. And I think there'll be a lot of more research as well on this one. Many of those who try to fit and just become puppets, or those who are victimized or those who have been bullied, I so believe that many people with undiagnosed autism find themselves in sort of places and used by drug dealers and other forms of depraved deviation. Many have been abused by such undetected criminals and the crimes on such people go unnoticed. Many autistic adults, particularly young adults, are torn to drugs when they're rejected from the family home and found themselves on the streets. Autistic adults who are drug and alcohol users do not respond to treatment in the ways that the civilian addict world would. My own recovery was long and painful. I found it hard to grasp the recovery method that I sought. However, recovery comes through perseverance, which autistic people can be gifted with. And resilience seems to be another attribute. Key workers on service involvement. Regarding key workers' involvement with an asparagus point. I believe it is imperative to understand that by and large, it's all, it's all black and white regarding the mindset of an autistic adult, and particularly young adults. Some flexibility may have been achieved with age, but to the younger ones, it can be extremely difficult for the client to understand, bear with me, Changes of rules, routines, etc., in the hustle routine and everyday life. From my own experience, not just with me, but others also, there have been incidents where something was promised or offered to be done and then fell through, resulting in the client entering into tantrums. How can these barriers be overcome? Maybe the key worker needs to be the leader of certain aspects of their authority. My suggestion is that meetings with key workers, doctors, social workers, are not subject to change or interrupted as far as possible. And that, I mean, these are not subject to closure or opened at unplanned times. If a key worker makes a mistake, in relation to a client's welfare, should they succumb to the nature of the asperger's mindset? This, I sense, is an area that needs balance for both parties involved. It's not ever going to be right. It's just like life itself. It's a case of learning from mistakes. However, with this in mind, I would ask staff to be mindful of our client's needs and have empathy to their condition. One area that could be benefit to those on the autistic spectrum is that a counseling service be in action as it's very expensive for individual therapy for autism. To sustain those who are vulnerable needs long-term goals and those goals put into action with the key worker and clients especially after identifying attributes and gifts with active engagement in hostile education and training. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be
very secure on the matter. And that's all I can say. Thank you, thank you all very, very much. Thanks, Desmond, for your insightful comments and for reminding us all that at the end of the day, it's the service user experiences that counts the most. Um, I'd like to finish up by thanking everyone who contributed to the presentation today um, and particularly to all our participants in the study, um, service users and staff um, and uh, the various organisations that were involved both in our steering group and in the conduct of the research in, in bringing this to fruition. Um, thanks very much as well to the NDA for allowing us this opportunity to do the research. Um, I hope that um, this research really contributes to uh, significant change within the sector and more effective service provision and service planning for people with autism in homelessness contexts. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you very much, um, Breege and all the presenters from DCU and particularly Desmond for sharing his um, lived experience with us. I think that was very, a very valuable addition. We're going to move to the panel discussion now in the interest of time. What I'll do is we'll play um, David's short video on the census data at the very end so that it'll be included in the recording. But if people need to leave at 12, then that's absolutely fine. So I'll invite the panelists now to turn on their cameras and microphones, please. You've already met um, Dr. Mary Rose Sweeney and Michelle from, from the DCU study. Um, and Mariana Donovan from uh, the Trinity study. But I'd also like to introduce uh, a Eamon Waters, who's the head of the business unit for homeless policy funding and capital delivery in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And also to Mr. Bernard O'Regan, who's head of strategy and planning in the HSE Disability Services and has a long history working in service provider organizations. So maybe, Eamon, could I come to you first and just maybe ask you for a few reflections on what you've heard in those studies and if there is anything that particularly struck you? And you yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rosalind. No, it's, it's, uh, it's very good to be here and uh, good, good to be invited. And this is to the minister in his opening remarks. I was sort of, uh, when I heard him saying uh, that, uh, I'd be able to answer any question that was uh, posed. Uh, I have to admire his confidence in me, and I hope I'll be able to um, provide provide whatever answers. Um, I'm I'm in situ now myself for the past two months. I've come into as, as the head of the, the the business unit, as you say, as the principal officer with responsibility for homelessness uh, policy, funding, and delivery. Um, so I think. An event like this and the research that was presented today um, gives, a, I think, a very valuable input in, into my own work, uh, into the work of the department in policy terms. Um, I suppose I do have a background in, in sort of research and evidence and foreign policy and, and my own kind of research going back, back a few years ago, doctoral research looked at particularly policy uh, policy challenges, policy failure, actually, um, policy success, and factors that 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 give rise to to those different um, different types of outcome. So, being able to get uh, an insight today from uh, I think two uh, highly competent research teams uh, and uh, from really high quality research uh, to inform policy, I think is really good. Um, I suppose a, a few things struck me, um, and maybe just to, to follow on maybe from some comments as well that the Minister had made about work that is uh, commencing in 2021 on consultation um, on uh, new strategies around housing and disability. I think it's a very, it's a very timely intervention, very timely seminar today and timely research as well that can feed into that and I think there's, there's a there's a channel there's an avenue for the recommendations in particular to feed in to that work but I think overall one of the things that struck me and, and it's something that I'm becoming more and more familiar with uh, in, in in my own work in this area is is the kind of multidisciplinary aspect and I, I suppose the, the fact that um, our work involves uh, and an awful lot of different 
bodies and agencies. Uh, it overlaps uh, with the statutory uh, sector, voluntary sector. Um, there's an advocacy element in trying to understand, um, I suppose, the need to work together is, is something that struck me. Now, I deal, I suppose, specifically with homelessness, uh, homeless policy. We have a significant budget now, a significant budget that increased again this year. I think partly a reflection of uh, the scale of the challenge we face, but I think partly as well a, a reflection of how seriously the issue is being taken uh, by government and I think by the by the political system in general. Um, so um, I think as well the, the distinction as, as well at when when we when we look at when we look at policy, maybe the distinction is made between. Uh, in housing terms, the, the need for a house or the need for a home, and then all the other, I suppose, services and supports that that can help people who are uh, in, in danger of, of of facing homelessness. And I think the importance of prevention as well. And, and prevention is about more than simply uh, the provision of, of of bricks and mortar. It's it's quite a quite a complex and 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 multifaceted. Uh, response that 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 is needed. So, I think a lot a lot of I suppose what what I heard today is broader than than the provision of of housing. But then again, at the core, and and it goes back to to some of the comments, some of the the, the, the comments from the participants in 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 the in the <coughs> study around the fundamental nature and fundamental importance of having the home uh, above pretty pretty much everything else. Uh, and from that point of view, I think a lot of policy, certainly government policy at the moment, is focused on significant delivery of of, of housing supply. So, with fifty thousand social housing units to be delivered over over the the, the coming period, the coming four years, uh, and significant investment this year. Like we, we got a record budget of three point three billion this year for housing alone, which is which is extraordinary in in relative terms. Uh, but it's not just about delivery of a generic social housing product. There's a need, and I think the program for government reflects that need to have an understanding of of the kind of broader issues, broader needs uh, around design, particularly around meeting specific needs. And I think that that's why uh, research like this is quite important. I think that's why it's 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 recognised as well in policy terms that. Uh, the development ha of housing policy has to be mindful, has to take on board th th those particular facets. So I suppose th th those would be sort of in initial mm. views. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in the position a number of months, uh, so I'm, I'm, I suppose, reasonably well placed at the moment to give give some perspectives uh, at, at this point. But uh, in terms of work going forward, I, I think the the work today has certainly been valuable and certainly been informative for me. And I think, as the minister said uh, in his opening remarks, that his officials, that that's me. It's also a broader group of officials in the department. I deal with homelessness. We have people who deal with housing policy, people who deal with building standards. There are a lot of different, um, I suppose, areas within the department that will be interested in what was produced today. I think it's important that it's disseminated and, and certainly um, as the minister has indicated, it will be, uh, and uh, not just uh, reviewed by me, but by colleagues with other responsibilities as well. So if there are any questions in the course of our interaction, I'd be happy to follow up further. But again, uh, thanks very right. much. And I look forward to coming back to maybe if there are further questions. OK, great. Th thanks, Eamon. Yeah, I think you raised some very important points there about the the need for collaboration and the fact that, you know, it's very multifactorial. It's not just one issue. There's, there's a lot of issues involved. Um, I'll remind people they can send questions in on the question and answer function. Um, but in the meantime, Bernard, maybe you'd give a few reflections on, on what you found from the studies. Uh, thanks, Ros, and good morning, everybody. And again, I'm uh, delighted to be uh, able to join the uh, webinar today. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank, take the opportunity of thanking uh, both uh, research teams uh, for produ producing two uh, really important uh, reports that set out, um, I suppose, in, in some respects, fairly clear, but also quite challenging 
uh, agendas of work, some of which are underway and some of which uh, um, I think would need to commence. I was very struck by a, a couple of things just by way of, of general comments. Um, first of all, that the solutions to homelessness for people, whether it's people with autism or people with intellectual disabilities or other uh, types of disability that people may have, isn't just down to one agency of, of the state. Um, it is about collaborative working. It is about aligning the supports for people with the housing supports for people with collaboration with the community and voluntary sectors as well. Um, and that while there are really good examples and really good evidence of that work, clearly there's a lot of work uh, still to be done. The, the second thing that strikes me is that uh, we do need to be able to forward plan as much as possible. Uh, the alignment of supports and services for people with disabilities, along with their housing needs, need to be planned into the future. And I was very uh, um, struck, um, uh, something I've been aware of uh, uh, through my own work, but I, I, I think it's always important to have it stated again. The challenge, for example, of adults living with uh, parents as who, who care for them uh, and planning for the future for those adults um, and the fact that you know so many adults continue to live with their parents and there isn't a clear pathway for them into a home of their own what, whatever that might may look like uh, uh, for them. The third thing I, I wanted to comment on was that in relation to some aspects of the recommendations that have been made, there is work going on. So for example, in relation to the last presentation, there is an autism program board that was established um, uh, by the HSE uh, at the beginning, uh, at the back end of 2019. And um, one of the strands of work for that uh, program board is to look at different ways in which assessments and diagnosis uh, might be undertaken, both for children and for adults. Unfortunately, because of the year that we've had, a lot of the work of that committee has uh, been more been limited, uh, but we will be kickstarting it again early in the new year. So I think there are some things that may be at their infancy or at very early stage, but certainly align with the recommendations which are from the, these reports, which I think is important and heartening that they're not working at a, a tangent or, or disconnected from what's really important to be focusing on. And again, I'd be happy to, to take any questions in the course of the discussion. Right. Thanks very much for that, Bernard. Um, yeah, some some very important points there. I was struck as well by the the elderly parents and, and, and people people living at home with them still. Um, and Marianne and Mary Rose, you, you both raised the issues of you know policy and the need for policy to sort of have more of a focus on autism and, and uh, intellectual disability. Um, I'm just wondering how you think that will work given the you know, a lot of the policies are quite generic and have a mainstreaming approach so that the, the policy for, for people with disabilities is supposed to, you know, cover all persons with disabilities. Or if it's a generic policy for, for the public, it should be inclusive and include people with disabilities. So if, if you get into sort of very specific issues around autism and intellectual disability, how, how do you think that would work? Or, or are there ways that can be done that don't um, interfere maybe with that mainstreaming, more mainstreaming approach? Maybe Mary, Mary Ann, do you want to go first? Just interested to hear your views on that. And, and if you have any comment on the other study as well, I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah, great. Um, I suppose I'll start with just commending DCU on, on their work. Um, really fantastic to hear almost from the other side of the sector and the issue in terms of engaging with the homeless service and the involvement of the Simon community. And I suppose what struck me was the commonality in terms of the invisibility of um, the population, um, unrecognised need, the, the gap in training for people involved in this sector, and also that impact of homelessness and on the health and well-being of people with autism and similarly on, with people with intellectual disability um, and that complexity of need and comorbidities that need to be addressed. So um, I think great piece of um, work by DCU and delighted to share the, uh, the stage with them today and in presenting. Um, in terms of the, the policy issue, Roz, and the, the question you asked, I suppose I have a quite particular um, opinion on that. And I've written a paper about this whole human rights um, 
framework and analysis of health and housing policy in Ireland. Um, and there is the policy of mainstreaming, there is the policy of inclusion, but sometimes when we talk about everybody and all, what we do is assume that we're all starting from the same base, but really we're not. So equality is obviously something we all strive for, but we have to consider equity. And unless we really identify the specific challenges and needs that populations have, and to name those supports, to name those needs and to address them, we're at risk of further exacerbating their exclusion from society and from policy. So I don't think being specific and addressing those needs and naming what those specific needs are is against mainstreaming. It's actually supporting mainstreaming because it leads to further inclusion in terms of policy, which then becomes inclusive practice in the way houses are built, in the way people can access their communities and in terms of accessing their supports. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marianne. Mary Rose, you want to come in there? Yeah, I would, I would completely concur with what Marianne said. Um, I think we need a specific action plan to, to underpin policy implementation. Otherwise, uh, we, we might not reach the needs, those very specific needs. And, and in fact, we, we found that in the Awesome Friendly University project that Bridge mentioned earlier, that for, for each principle we developed, there was like a list of maybe 10 specific actions that were needed to underpin that. So, so I think Marianne is right. Um, we, uh, we obviously need to take care when um, devising that action plan that it doesn't um, disadvantage anybody else. I think that's the key thing, that everything we do should have a beneficial knock-on effect for everybody. Right, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, Michelle, you're, you're our person really on the on the cold face to, to a certain extent. Um, and I'm, uh, you, you made some very good points there in, in the video about how the sort of practical elements could be, um, you know, that, that you and your colleagues could use. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, do you find, um, you know, you're firefighting a lot of the time. And I'm also wondering whether COVID has sort of slowed things down a little bit and given you a chance to breathe and maybe think about some of these larger issues, or is it something that you're always working on in the background? Yeah, absolutely. We are kind of always firefighting now. Disclaimer, I don't work in a frontline service. I work in our research and advocacy um, department, which is um, largely office-based, but I work quite closely with a lot of people in our services. Um, COVID has been an interesting experience for us. There was a lot of, um, I suppose, uncertainty and, and anxiety at the start. And for a population that were already quite isolated and marginalized, everything shutting down, the places that you can go during the day to sit in and have a cup of coffee or drop in and charge your phone or have a chat with something were all closed down. So that was massively exacerbated. Um, people couldn't see their families and they mightn't have necessarily had the I suppose quarantine luxuries that the rest of us had where you might be having your Zoom quiz on a Saturday night and chatting with your friends and stuff. Um, but I have to say we're really proud of our response to the pandemic and our frontline staff, our volunteers and our clients just have been absolutely amazing throughout. Um, in some of the services, we ended up actually having some quite positive outcomes where um, the clients were just in the service all day and ended up having really positive engagement and rapport building with the staff. Um, because the clients had to be on site and weren't able to go out, um, it allowed for a lot of kind of activities and relationship building and um, obviously in a safe and socially distanced way. Um, so it was very much a mixed bag, but I think I'm really proud of where we work and how we've coped with it. And it was a real kind of testament to how adaptable and flexible and client-centered our organization is. Right, Thank, thanks, Michelle. Um, Bernard, I just wanted to come back to you with a, just a question on, um, like traditionally the, the HSE and the voluntary service providers would have provided the accommodation for 
generally people with disabilities, mostly people with intellectual disabilities. So with deinstitutionalization, there's much more engagement with local authorities and the private rental sector. I'm just wondering how have services and the HSE sort of dealt with that? I mean, I, I assume there's a bigger administrative burden. You know, there's a lot more contacts have to be made and, and collaborations. And, you know, how, how is that working in general? Are, are staff becoming much more um, efficient, if you like, at that? Um, I, I think like everything, Roz, it, there, there's no one answer to that. And the experience is um, varied in different organisations and in different parts of the country. So I'd be aware of really good uh, collaborations between providers and local authorities in terms of exploring how they can work together to develop the housing options for people and, and particularly in the context of decongregation, which has resulted, for example, in housing uh, being adapted and developed to meet the needs of uh, people with disabilities who are moving from congregate settings uh, on the basis of a, um, a, I suppose, dual investment uh, where CAS funding is used to develop the housing, but some of the additional costs that might be needed are funded by the HSE. And we've worked out ways of being able to collaborate around those kinds of uh, uh, projects. I, I suppose from a, a, a systemic point of view, the HSE, in terms of a policy direction is always keen that housing and accommodation would be provided separate from service provision. Um, uh, uh, so we're very supportive of organizations developing their own approved housing bodies and splitting off the oversight and delivery of, of, of housing and particularly social housing from the provision of services, which is the, the piece that the, the HSE and disability services um, they should be doing. I think we have um, staff across the country who have developed a lot of really good relationships and really good skills in terms of working collaboratively with other agencies uh, to plan for housing. Um, and we've done a lot of work in recent years, particularly um, with some of the uh, SRF grants that have been available uh, to us from, through the Department of Health um, and, and philanthropy to try to explore how those kinds of relationships and uh, uh, ways of working cross-sectorally can uh, work to the benefit ultimately of people that we uh, um, are supporting and who require the housing. Great, yeah, thank you. That's It's, it's interesting how, how things are developing over time. Um, Eamon, maybe just to come back to you, the, uh, you know, as the Minister said, the new um, housing strategy for persons with disabilities will be developed. And, you know, the emphasis within that over the next year will very much be on the housing part. But do you think there's scope for, you know, improving services for people with disabilities who are homeless? it can be put as part of that strategy? Do you think there's scope or, or will it very much focus just on the housing part? Well, I think, you know, as, as, as I mentioned, I think there's, there's an element around housing, there's an element around prevention, and, and then there's also an element maybe that goes beyond that into service provision when, when people are uh, accessing homeless services you know whether that's in relation to hostels or other support services which which is more directly i suppose uh, related to homelessness so i think i think there is there is scope around that point with um the area of prevention i think i think there is an awareness already within housing policy that say in relation to housing need, and, and this would be uh, in relation to people who are identified as having a housing need and are on a housing waiting list, that, that we do have uh, knowledge and we do have data around um, the numbers of people uh, who are on housing waiting lists who have disabilities um, and have specific needs. So I think there already is a level of work there and a level of understanding and, and then you have specific uh, policy responses and, and there's a mention there of, of, of some of the schemes that are used to fund capital programs for specific housing developments. Uh, so I think there is a recognition. I, I certainly would see it like, for example, this year and um, budget 2021 um, 
and I mentioned the, the allocation of funding for uh, housing on homelessness and also in, in other areas. But in parallel with that, uh, a couple of months back before the budget, um, our minister, Minister O'Brien, met with Minister Donnelly. And then at an official level, we would have met with our counterparts within the Department of Health around having parallel funding streams uh, for Department of Housing on the one hand to provide the accommodation and then Department of Health on the other hand to source the additional resources to provide uh, the supports um, that deal with the kind of health needs of, of individuals who are home. It kind of speaks to a level of collaboration. So I suppose the short answer is yes. I think in the um, in that consultation process, I think those elements can be can be introduced. But I think in, in, in the broader work, uh, it kind of speaks to a need, and, and, and it's been mentioned by other speakers as well already, uh, for good collaboration between departments and then between um, government departments and agencies uh, and NGOs uh, and others okay. then who have knowledge of this area. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think Marianne was, has a question there for you, Eamon, I think. Do you want to come in there, Marianne? Yeah, no, just uh, in terms of the consultation, I'd be interested to know what would be the definition of housing need that will guide the consultation. So as we've seen, homelessness is defined in, in many different ways. Um, we were using quite a broad definition of housing need um, and like that incorporating older people, older adults with intellectual disability living with aging parents. For some, they may not see that as a housing need because they're in a house and it's, you know, fine, but... It is a housing need. The person hasn't got choice or the possibility at the present to move out and live independently. So I just would be interested from, I suppose, the HSE's point of view and from the Department of Housing, what do they define as a housing need? Yeah, well, I suppose maybe to come back on that initially, I mean, there is, you're right, there is a, a particular definition of homelessness. It's, it's set out uh, in in. The Housing Act 1988 in Section 2, yeah. that, that's, that's I suppose, in the, the formal legal sense, that that's what homelessness is defined as. Uh, there is then, I suppose, the broader housing need question, and that is dealt with through eligibility for, for social housing supports. Uh, so somebody can have a housing need and not be homeless, and, and that's the way, uh, I suppose, the, the, uh, our structures are set up in terms of dealing with those, dealing with those issues. So that is, I suppose, in, in, in coming back to your, to your question, homelessness has a definition and then housing need is also defined in a different way. Uh, so we, we tend not to conflate the two, even though somebody with a housing need can be in danger of becoming homeless. Um, and we kind of acknowledge that in our own work on the homelessness side. So we, we put money into uh, prevention programs uh, staff at local authorities, uh, identifying people who are in danger of becoming homeless, uh, uh, and so on. So th those are, I suppose, are the two distinctions in 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 how we work. Uh, so the policy, as I understand it, and, and and I'm not heavily involved in in the policy initiative going into next year. I suppose my, my area is more more specific, but uh, we we will be contributing to it and, and working together with others in the department. But those are the distinctions that currently operate in relation to homelessness and housing need. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, Eamon. I just I think there's a question from the floor. Someone wants to get in from the floor. So, Cormac, if we can, maybe maybe we'll make that the last question. If we can give that person a mic. Yeah. There was just a comment from Miss Emer Lynch from the Doris oh. of Charity. If All right, will, will I just read it out then, or does she want to ask it? No, she can ask it, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay, Imer, have you, can you, have you been given? I suppose um, one of the things that Imer, uh, what the Doors of Charity have been doing is they have set up an approved housing body, to, so that separation between housing and service provision is, is taking place there with the Marriott Foundation. Um, but there's just another point that Imer wanted to come in on. I don't know whether she's been. Yeah, I can see her microphone is still off there. I'm not able to. I tried to promote her to panelist, but. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Am I? Am I that okay now? 
Okay. No, Mike, I think you've got two laptops on, Emma. You'd need to turn one of them off. Yeah, maybe, well, just, did she type in her question there? Uh, she typed it to me. I suppose one of the things that she yeah, wanted to say was that there was some positive outcomes um, from this, I suppose, that came, happened after the study and to highlight that um, the gentleman sharing a room has been offered his own room now and the lady who was homeless was rehoused during COVID in her own apartment with a social housing body. Um, and Nadia's also been housed as well. Um, so she's saying there's some positive outcomes that have happened this year with COVID as well. And it was just important to highlight that instead of only focusing on, um, on the negatives as well, but that things are changing for some people. That's that's great. Thank you very much, Emer, for, for highlighting that. It, it is really important because we can tend to become overly negative with things. And I suppose Eamon would probably say that, you know, the numbers of, of homeless have been decreasing over the COVID period as well. So that's that's positive also. Uh, I'm very conscious of time um, and I'm sorry we haven't had more time for a discussion, but I think I'm going to what I'm going to do is conclude there. I just thank a few people and then we'll go straight into David's video and then just turn off the the webinar then when he finishes so you don't have to stay for that part if, if you if you need to go and um, so i just like to thank uh, all the panelists for your um participation today and for the presentations that were given i think we've discussed some important issues um and i i, I i'm maybe putting words into eamon's mouth now but i'm sure he'd be he'd love everybody to get engaged in that consultation on the new housing strategy for persons with disabilities next year um, uh, who are, yeah, particularly thanks to Desmond for sharing his insights with us, to our interpreters, Catherine and Bernadette, and our captioner, Michelle. Um, and I'd like to give a special mention to our behind the scenes uh, team, Cormac, Downit, Kleena, Edward, Jacintha, and Elaine. Um, because, you know, this doesn't all happen, you know, without a little bit of work in the background and somebody keeping an eye on the technology. Uh, be sure and look up the reports of the two studies uh, should be up online now, along with um, our new infographic on where people with disabilities live. Um, and then it just leaves me to wish you all a, a very happy Christmas and thank you very much. So Cormac, you can play uh, the last presentation there, please. Thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is David Hanlon, I'm a research officer in the area of uh, economics and statistics at the National Disability Authority. I'd like to begin by uh, welcoming the Minister and all of our attendees and uh, thanking you for taking the time to join us this morning. So the focus of this presentation is the housing circumstances of persons with disabilities in Ireland. Uh, all of the statistics that will be presented uh, have been derived from the uh, census of the population data. Before we look at any graphics, it would perhaps be best to define some of the key terms employed. So a private household is defined as one or more person living at the same address with common housekeeping arrangements, such as sharing meals together or sharing a common living room. A communal establishment is defined as an establishment which provides managed residential accommodation. And the term homelessness denotes sleeping rough or staying in temporary accommodation because one has nowhere else to go and is generally unable to provide accommodation from one's own resources. So at the outset, we're going to look at the share of the general population and persons with disabilities living in different types of housing circumstances. What we observe is that the vast majority of persons with disabilities live in private accommodation, but that this share is lower than that for the general population writ large. This is because a greater share of persons with disabilities live in communal establishments. So I'm just going to uh, expand these so we can observe the trends in greater detail. Uh, we can observe on the left that the share of persons with disabilities living in communal establishments has declined in the five-year period from 2011 to 2016, though this remains significantly higher than for the general population. 
If we consider persons who are homeless, what we observe is that a larger share of persons with disabilities are homeless as compared to that for the general population. So we're going to now look at some findings in terms of the circumstances of persons with disabilities who are resident in private households. So firstly, what we observe is that the share of persons with disabilities who live in a property that is owner occupied is roughly comparable to that for the general population. However, looking towards the rental market, what we observe is that the share of persons with disabilities renting from a private landlord is significantly lower than for the general population as a whole. And this gap is almost entirely explicable in terms of the higher proportion of persons with disabilities who are renting from a local authority. Also notably, um, a significantly higher proportion of persons with disabilities are renting their property from a voluntary body. Next, we consider the share of persons with disabilities living in private accommodation who are living alone as compared to the general population. And this is broken down by um, age group. What you observe is that persons with disabilities are generally more likely to be living alone, but also that the gap relative to the general population is, is highest in the 35 to 64 uh, age range. Next, we consider the circumstances of persons resident in communal establishments. Uh, this graphic displays the share of persons with disabilities across a selection of communal establishments examined in the census data. What we see is that the vast majority of persons enumerated as resident in the nursing and children's homes category of communal establishment have some form of disability. There's also a noteworthy decline in the prevalence of disabilities in the hospital environment, which is attributable to um, the fact of older persons staying in their homes for longer and um, receiving care in more appropriate care settings than, than in hospitals. Finally, we turn to the issue of homelessness. Um, as observed earlier, persons with disabilities are more likely to be homeless as compared to the general population writ large. Another noteworthy finding is that the, the share of homeless persons with disabilities who are male is higher than that for the total homeless population. If we look at the prevalence of disabilities in the homeless population by disability type, we observe that 27% of all homeless persons in Ireland reported having some form of disability. Uh, this represents a noteworthy reduction as compared to 2011 when this figure stood at 41.5%. Uh, this finding suggests that while the total number of homeless persons with disabilities has increased in recent years, um, the general prevalence of disabilities among the, ho the homeless population has declined. And finally, the most uh, common type of disability among the homeless population was a psychological or emotional condition. So if you have any questions on this presentation or indeed the accompanying um, briefing paper, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, at the email address on screen. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much, David, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Catherine. Sorry, we went a little bit over.